The last Pac-12 championship game in conference history, the first Pac-12 championship game between Oregon and Washington, and this is how the Huskies won it, sealing it thanks to Dylan Johnson, who had himself a night. Two rushing touchdowns, a passing touchdown, over 150 yards on the ground, as Bo Nix does not get a chance to answer back. He threw a 63-yard touchdown bomb before that possession to make it a three-point game, but Washington salts it away, gets a first down, kneels it out and wins it 34-31, their third Pac-12 championship in school history, and they are headed to the college football playoff for the first time since 2016. Welcome in two-time Super Bowl champ Bryant McFadden, CBS Sports HQ college football analyst Barrett Salee. And BMAC, you can't spell Washington without wagon. Your reaction to what you just saw. Wow. Uh, outstanding performance, right, guys? You talk about a team that was a nine-point underdog, depending on where you, you were shopping. Clearly no respect given based on how well they performed the entire season. And oh, by the way, they beat Washington early in the year. But the odds maker felt like coming into today's matchup, they were not the best team. Oh, man, did they prove a lot of naysayers wrong. Another outstanding performance by Michael Penix Jr. You talked about his receivers. But what about Dylan Johnson, man? Dylan Johnson just totally just dominated this ball game in the trenches. Big time playmaker, and when they needed a big time closer to, to come in and seal the game for them, guess who it was? Dylan Johnson. Hats off to the entire Huskies staff, the players, the personnel. A magical year that is still ongoing. Yeah, yeah, BMAC, I think one of the most interesting things to me is, is why was Washington an underdog? It's because Oregon was a more complete team in theory. They have a better defense. They had a more suck, uh, a consistent defense. Well, everything we said about Oregon's defense going into the game, we'll say it about Washington now. They only let uh, Oregon gain 363 yards, and Oregon was 3 of 10 on third downs. That's domination against a really, really good Oregon team. So they earned it. The narrative that all of us had about Oregon before the game, it got switch, it got flipped, and it got flipped because of the Washington defense. So we can talk about Dylan Johnson. We can talk about the receivers. We can talk about uh, Michael Penix Jr. And all of them were fantastic. The MVP of this game is that entire Washington defense. It looked awful pretty much all season, and it looked incredible tonight. Well, BMAC, I'll point out that Oregon had the third best third down conversion in all of FBS this season behind mm -hmm. LSU and Georgia. Washington was in the top 20. And if you look at the numbers, Oregon on this night, three for 10 on third down, Washington 10 of 15. And I know about that drive to start the second half where they converted a fourth and five, a third and nine, a third and two, and they scored on a fourth and goal. But when it came down to it, as you heard Barrett say, the Washington defense stood up in this game and you saw mm -hmm. them set the tone early in this game. Yeah, when you talk about playing against good on good, it's important to start fast. And the execution that we saw from Washington was well documented in getting off to a fast start. And then we saw that we saw that surge coming from the Ducks. You talked about the, the scoring drive right before halftime and then receiving the ball out of the locker room in the third quarter, scoring right then and there. But the adjustments, and you talk about how well uh, Washington defense was buried. Hakeem, I agree. But one of the things that I want to hit on, how well they tackled. We saw yes. great tackling and open field opportunities for the Huskies defenders. And you talk about the skill set, the positional players for Oregon, they make people miss. I mean, it's hard to tackle those guys in a phone booth, better yet open field. But Washington did a phenomenal job tackling the catch. You didn't see a lot of yak, you know, and that was important for their success, not to mention the ground game. When you look at Oregon's offense, when they're at their best, they're going fast, they're utilizing tempo, but what else, guys? They run the football. They were not able to run the football. Their leading carrier, ball carrier today was the quarterback. That's not yeah. ideal for their success based on what we've seen in past games. So hats off to the entire Husky staff. Yeah, we saw some points in the second half coming from both Knicks, but that's the type of offense they have. But the way they executed on third down, most importantly for Washington, man, they had a great game plan and they were dialed in from start to finish. Yeah, you mentioned start to finish. That's exactly where I was going to take it, B-Mac, because at the start of the game, Washington's defense came out hot, 
and Oregon went to a three and out the first two possessions of the game. And ultimately that had Oregon kind of fighting an uphill battle for the rest of the game, kind of playing a little desperate. Even when they had the lead, it didn't feel like there was a ton of confidence on that side, and it felt like Washington still had to come. And look at this. I, this number really stands out to me. Both of these teams like to run a lot of plays, right? Time of possession really doesn't matter all that much to them. Washington ran 78 plays. Oregon ran 54. I haven't had a chance wow. to look uh, at, at what they've done this season, but I would bet that's either the lowest or second fewest they've played or made all year long 54 plays for a dynamic offense that is unbelievable and it's not something we expected from the ducks and i do think those three and outs the first two possessions of the game had a big big fact it was a were big big factors in this game because from a mindset perspective i think it sort of changed the game plan with from what dan Lanning wanted to do with this team well washington had the football for 15 minutes more than oregon and they did set the tone in the first quarter because the time of possession was 13 minutes and 13 seconds for Washington, 147 for Oregon, <laughs> and 117 to 9 in yards. And look, wow. Dan Lanning deferred, right, to, to start this yeah. game. Washington comes down, and it, it, it ends in points. They want to get a touchdown, but it, it ends in a field goal to sort of get the jitters out, to get on the scoreboard. And then from there, they had the 10 nothing lead, and then you saw... That turning point, though, from Oregon at the end of the first half, you get that touchdown to Terrence Ferguson on third and goal to make it 20 to 10. They scored 21 straight points. You saw what Bo Nix was able to do, throws the 63-yard bomb to answer. I mean, he played his tail off, Barrett, and this yeah. is his final game of his college career. He can go play in a bowl game, of course, but his final game to have a chance to win a Pac-12 title comes up short. What did you see from that young man who's had a heck of a college football career? Yeah, it just kept fighting. I mean, things were not going his way. And I'm not I'm talking about him personally. I'm talking about that entire team. It felt disjointed. And I think because of him, B-Mac mentioned 69 yards rushing. He was their leading rusher. That's not supposed to happen uh, for Oregon. They're too talented. They're too deep in the backfield for that to happen. Last year, maybe not this year. So he put that team on his shoulders. He did all that he could do. And I think he deserves to be credited for that. He deserves praise for that. Uh, but uh, in the end, I think it's just it proves a little bit like what we what we kind of we thought earlier that Oregon was the most complete team going in, but they were flawed. And, and I think maybe that offense hid those flaws a little bit more than we expected. But man, for Bo Nix, what a career up and down at Auburn beats Alabama's freshman year. The roller coaster ride of all roller coaster rides could have won the Heisman last year before he got hurt. Probably will be in New York this year despite this loss and to see it in like this I mean I think he can he can say without uh, any doubt that he's one of the toughest players he's a legend he's one of the most consistent players in all of college football once he got to Oregon and it just came up a little short against a better football team Barrett I'm gonna go right back to you here because you're a Heisman voter did Bo Nix do enough he was the Heisman favorite entering this game did he do enough to get enough votes to win the Heisman trophy I don't think he did enough to get enough votes because there are a lot of people, if you haven't submitted your ballot yet, and I have not submitted my ballot, you're, you're going to look at this game and say, okay, what really did he do for his team? And I think for a lot of us, uh, overall team success does matter. And he's not going to the playoff. And that same knock can be had against Jaden Daniels. So you kind of wait in a bunch of different ways. Uh, did he lose the Heisman? I wouldn't say he lost it, but... I think in terms of who's the favorite, I would love to see where the odds are going right now, right this very second, because I think Jaden Daniels uh, would be flying up those boards. But uh, for me personally, the most important player in college football could be Iowa punter Tory Taylor. But Iowa Springs, the upset tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, oh, come on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like the slider you just threw to us. <laughs> Barrett, nice slider, by the way. I, I think <laughs> both quarterbacks in tonight's matchup, either or, Michael Penix Jr. or Bo Nix, didn't do enough to win the Heisman, in my opinion. Outstanding players, I think both players will get the invite to New York, but in yeah. regards to winning the award, having that Heisman-like moment to win it, no, nah, I don't think so. I think if I had a vote, my fake vote, even though I don't have a vote, it would go to Jaden Daniels. And I understand Jaden Daniels, his team has not participated in championship weekend. I understand they're not competing for a playoff spot. But in regards to what he did this season alone, name me another quarterback that was called to do so much for his team.
so much for his offense. He had to be the best passer, of course, playing the quarterback position. Also, the best runner for this mm -hmm. for his team as well, for, for the LSU Tigers. So I think Jaden Daniels was the best quarterback, was the most consistent quarterback. He put up video game-like numbers. And if you want to see exactly how good and Jay, how good Jaden Daniels was, put up Jaden Daniels' season, his stats, next to Joe Burrow's year, the last year he was there in yep. Baton Rouge. And that tells you the tale of the story right there alone. So my vote, if I had a vote, I don't. But if I did, it would be Jaden Dane. Yeah, I mean, fifth SEC uh, player to have 50 total touchdowns, and the other four all went on to win the Heisman. So at this point, it feels like Jaden Daniels is the Heisman Trophy winner again. He led the country in touchdown passes. I can't say anything. My lips are sealed. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to do that. I'm just going to give you the context here. Led the country in touchdown passes, yards per attempt, and rushing yards by a quarterback. The thing is, the quarterback wow. that advances – will not be winning the Heisman, Michael Penix Jr., but he gets to go and play in the college football playoff, and he does so with Kalen DeBoer, which I feel like most of the country doesn't know about Kalen DeBoer, and I want to read you his record in the last two years at Washington. 24-2, and BMAC, Kalen DeBoer. <laughs> we need to make his name more present. I feel like he doesn't get enough credit. Michael Penix beats Oregon twice this season. Kalen DeBoer, great play caller, uh, came from NAIA, won some championships there, and now he's got this program into the college football playoff. What does it say about Kalen DeBoer? Great coach, a guy that can relate to the players, a guy that can get these kids to buy in to the system, and he's a disciplinarian. You don't see a lot of mistakes coming from Washington, right, on either side of the football. They, they focus on the little things, and because of that, they've had a magical year. Even, even if you go back to last year's C team for them, they did some pretty good things, and, and you look at the balance that they have, I mean, they got a fighting shot in the postseason. This is a team that has a pro quarterback, that has a pro running back, that has pro wide receivers, and they got guys in the secondary that will be playing on Sunday. When you have all of that talent that's being coached the right way, you have a legit shot. And that's why they're currently in the top four, waiting for the rest of the spots to be uh, taking after, after tomorrow's matchup. So he's done a phenomenal job, man. He's one of the best coaches in college football. That no one talks about. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, he, he is fantastic. And, and what he's done with this program over the last couple seasons is incredible. They're heading to the Big Ten next season. But let's stay in the moment here because what we have here now, Barrett, is we play the prediction situation. We play the hypotheticals. Is there any chance, and there's probably zero, but what we're looking at here, right, is probably Washington playing Michigan if everything mm -hmm. holds. If Alabama loses to Georgia, if Georgia stays undefeated, wins the SEC title, Michigan beats Iowa, it's going to be one, two, three, and then whatever happens with that fourth spot. So Washington right now, Barrett, is looking at a matchup against Michigan. Your thoughts on potentially that matchup in the CFP semis? Well, I can't wait to see it because... This Washington team looked more complete tonight than it has all year long. And they also have a much more dynamic offense. So to me, uh, I would have said before this game that Washington would have no shot. Now I think they do have a shot. And, and you know, it's styles make fights. And right now, if, if this Michigan, uh, uh, if, I'm sorry, if this Washington team, and you talked about it, BMAC, uh, three wide receivers that anybody in the country would like. Dylan Johnson, a phenomenal running back, and Mike Michael Penix, we all know what Michael Penix can do. If they just hit two or three big plays against Michigan, assuming it's Michigan, that's going to put a ton of pressure on that entire offense, specifically J.J. McCarthy. And we haven't seen J.J. McCarthy in a situation this year, or really throughout his career except for the TCU game, where he has to go out and win the game with his arm. Sure, the Ohio State game last time out was close, but they controlled that game pretty much throughout. If Washington can hit a couple of big plays, then – I don't think Michigan's going to be comfortable at all because it'll be a situation that they're just not familiar with. They have not done it. So I'm much more intrigued about that game now, assuming it happens, than I was about four and a half hours ago because Washington can play defense. And shout out to Jabbar Muhammad. I don't think enough people realize how good that that guy is. He, he basically won the Oregon State game uh, in that secondary and did a great job tonight as well. So um, it's a complete football team. I can't wait to see it. If it's Washington, Michigan, I think Washington's got a shot. And, and what I'll say in regards to that matchup, too, potential hypothetical we're talking about, how many pro-like quarterbacks 
has Michigan's defense faced this season? Right? I would say none that we can maybe think of Drew right now. Miller? I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe right? Maybe, maybe, maybe I mean, right there. And that's a strong, that's a maybe. But in regards yeah. to Washington, their defense, they've seen a lot of pro-like talent at the quarterback position just within the Pac-12 alone. And they've mm-hmm. been outstanding, even tonight against Bo Nix. They've seen a lot of pro-like offensive skill position players in their conference as well. And they've been able to be able, they, they stepped up to the task. So there's a lot that can take place. But in regards to this matchup, it kind of gives me TCU, Michigan vibes from what we saw last <laughs> oh, year. Oh, stop. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Right? You're, are you, are, hold on, am I hearing, you're saying <laughs> that Washington is the role of TCU? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I'm saying in regards to this matchup that we're talking about, this hypothetical going against a Michigan defense that has been, remember last year's Michigan defense was dominant as well. But then when they played against TCU, they got exposed, especially in the secondary. And those wide receivers that Michigan, that Washington has, have currently, Mm -hmm. they're better than the wide receivers that TCU have. Hey, their wide receiver one from Washington, I think is better than Quentin Johnson was last year for TCU, not to mention the quarterback position is better as well. So that's why I say in regards to the onslaught of points that we saw from TCU, it kind of gives me the same vibes that potentially we would see if Washington was to face off against Michigan's defense. Because as we mentioned, I don't know one pro-like quarterback the Wolverines defense has faced this year. They've been getting by playing against above average play at the quarterback position and dominant against those guys. But when you talk about playing against Michael Penix, any small mistake, any, you know, misleverage in coverage, he is going to exploit those matchups. And we've seen him do that the entire season. Hint why he will be getting that invite to New York. Well, and Michigan. Of course, and of course, guys, Michigan gets to face that dynamic passing attack tomorrow of Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> Team total of six and a half. Uh, Washington and Michigan will be conference members starting next season. But is, if everything stands right now, we're going to get to see them in the college football playoff semifinals as Washington wins the Pac-12 title and punches their ticket to the college football playoff. BMAC Barrett Salee here on CBS Sports HQ. Michael Penix Jr. leading the Huskies to 20 straight wins. And one of their biggest wins in program history as they win the final Pac-12 championship game in conference history. And it is Michael Penix and the Huskies on to the CFP. College football playoff implications ahead next on CBS Sports HQ.